Good day. Shortly after the British government took the whimsical and frankly um, um, irresponsible step of sending Royal Navy um, destroyers into the Black Sea at a time when the United States was choosing not to send them, given the, in the heightened tensions around Ukraine and in the Black Sea at that time, the British government has doubled down by sending the British Navy to the Far East, where, it, where in the form of HMS Queen Elizabeth, one of Britain's two aircraft carriers and a number of escort ships, it will, it will visit certain countries like India, Korea and Japan, which are known to have difficult relations with China. Moreover, despite um, a, um, assertions by British Defence Minister Ben Wallace that this uh, naval deployment is not intended to be provocative, it appears that Britain is now intending to maintain a permanent naval uh, presence in the, uh, in the Pacific, in the Far East, which can only ultimately be directed at China. This is an extraordinarily irresponsible and reckless uh, step, and can I also say a pointless one. Sending the Royal Navy in to the Black Sea was foolish enough, uh, foolish both because of the risk and by the pointlessness of the exercise, but sending the Royal Navy to take on China in the Far East compounds that manyfold. This is not just because um, a British aircraft carrier and its escort ships are not going to make any significant difference to the strategic and military balance in the Far East. It is also because of the very fraught and difficult history between Britain and China, extending back to the 19th century, which is little known in Britain, but is, which is ve very well remembered in China. In previous programmes I have done about modern Chinese history, I have discussed that at, during the 19th century, as the imperial Qing government of China at that time began to weaken, China became the subject of predatory actions by the Western colonial powers and later by Japan. Of the Western colonial powers, it is perhaps fair to say that the one which the Chinese found to be the most aggressive was Britain, which at that time was at the height of its Victorian empire and greatest point of power. The British carried out, waged two wars against China in the 1840s and 1860s, the first of which is called the Opium War, and in, uh, over the course of which the British essentially forced China to open its uh, doors to the import of opium from British-controlled India in order to balance a uh, trade surplus which uh, China had then had up to that point been running with Britain and which was causing concern to the British Treasury. This war um, was um, uh, a affair which um, exacerbated a major problem with opium in China and which was deeply humiliating to the Chinese nation and remains so to this day. This was followed by a further war in the 1860s in which a British and French expedition commanded by British officers marched all the way to Beijing where they burnt down the summer palace of the emperor, uh, a, a parts of which remain ruined and have been kept so by the Chinese in commemoration of that particular event. Um, I would add that it was also during this period 
that the British were able to force China to part with Hong Kong, which became a British colony, and that Britain also, uh, with the help of China, established the so-called International Settlement in Shanghai, which also became a major centre of British power and influence in China. By the end of the 19th century, British influence in China had become so extensive that British officials even controlled and managed the Chinese Customs Service, which was the major source of revenue for the Chinese imperial government. Lastly, during the events in the early 20th century, the so-called Boxer Uprising, as it is called in Britain and in the West, the Chinese have an entirely different name for it. During that period, when the Chinese people attempted again to resist British colonial um, in, uh, expansion into China and the colonial expansion of other um, Western powers, um, at that time also the British commanded and led another, another uh, military expedition to Beijing, which destroyed, amongst other buildings, the famous Hanlin Academy in Beijing, where China, um, um, where China preserved much of its literary heritage. So the Chinese have a long history of very difficult relations with Britain and um, continue to resent, to a great extent, the behaviour of the British towards China in the 19th century, a, uh, uh, something which, by the way, persisted right up until the final collapse of the British Empire um, uh, um, during the period of the Second World War. I would add that British museums and private collections are full, gorged with Chinese art and Chinese artefacts looted from China during this period by British adventurers and British uh, um, um, collectors and which have ended up to this day in British museums. So this is the country that Britain is now deciding that it is going to challenge. But of course, it is not the China, the weakened, enfeebled, uh, divided China that Britain took on in the 19th century. It is, on the contrary, a China which is today the world's biggest industrial and manufacturing power and the country which is increasing the size of its fleet faster than any other country in the world. For Britain to venture into this quarrel between China and the United States is beyond reckless and beyond foolish, and it is extraordinarily pointless. For the British to say that the Chinese will not see this as a provocative step is to show a complete failure to understand both Chi recent Chinese history and British interactions with it, and also um, it is, it, and it is also um, um, treating the Chinese as in some way stupid and unable to understand that this naval deployment is obviously directed against them. Now, why are the British doing this? And this is actually a very good question, because Britain, until fairly recently, especially when David Cameron was prime minister up to 2016, was actually courting China, um, trying to persuade China to invest more heavily in the British economy, asking Chinese assistance to build nuclear power stations in Britain, seeking a um, golden age of good relations with China based on the tough-minded um, um, understanding, a realistic understanding, that China is the rising economic power. It's difficult to explain this, but I suspect that there are some people within the current British government 
who feel that a that Britain post Brexit has to align itself even more closely with the United States because it is through a relationship with the United States that Britain's economic future lies. Well, I beg to differ about that. I by no means say that Britain should not pursue close economic relations with the United States, trade deals and the rest, but relying exclusively on a close economic connection with the United States seems to me unrealistic and unwise. Britain, if it is indeed going to be a global Britain, as, Brit as the British government says, simply cannot afford to quarrel at this time with the world's biggest manufacturing power, its biggest trading economy, and the economy which, by 2030, even in nominal terms, is likely to become the biggest economy in the world. Britain has no direct quarrel with China at this time, and for the British fleet to float up and down the Pacific, pretending that Britain is somehow able to exert itself against China is foolish and can only result in Britain losing commercial opportunities in China, which it should instead be aggressively building. I would add that other European countries, like Germany, are not making that mistake. Critical as I am of Angela Merkel's government in Germany, Merkel and the Germans have understood very well the importance for Germany of a close economic relationship with China and have forged ahead with it despite the difficulties which currently exist between China and the United States. Britain ought to be doing the same. I have to say that on top of this belief that Britain's future somehow depends on the United States, there is an element of vainglory about this. The idea that the Royal Navy can somehow make a difference in this clash of giants seems to me to be a backward-looking uh, uh, approach um, invoking, evoking uh, memories of a uh, former past which realistically have no bearing on Britain's existing realities. Suffice to say that the last time the British Navy faced off against China was not it was in a British film, a James Bond film, in 1997, um, Tomorrow Never Dies, in which the British, uh, uh, a British destroyer, is tricked into a battle in the South China Sea, with the Chinese Air Force flying above. Um, in the real world, um, that's simply not going to happen, and. I would point out that the last time the Royal Navy deployed seriously in these waters by itself was actually way back in 1942 when two British battleships, um, the HMS Prince of Wales and the HMS Repulse, were destroyed by Japanese air power three days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Britain has neither the military means nor the clout to take on China. It really has no role in this quarrel. It needs to put aside these absurd fantasies that it can make a difference. And I would add that it needs to give up the idea that the United States, which has a very realistic understanding of the balance of military power in the Far East, will be at all impressed by these British naval exercises. I suspect that in reality, people in the US Navy, the commanders of the US Navy and the Pentagon, far from being impressed by these British actions, will be annoyed 
and exasperated by them. There must be some people in the Pentagon, for example, who remember how the United States had to come to the British Army's rescue in Iraq and Afghanistan during the wars there, when the previous British government of Tony Blair insisted on sending them there. And I am sure that the Pentagon would not be happy at being forced to come to the rescue of the Royal Navy in the Far East if it ever got itself into trouble. So this operation, this deployment, achieves nothing. Britain needs to put its imperial past behind it and its illusions that it is still a great military power. Quite simply, it is not. It is not a great military power in the Black Sea or indeed on the continent of Europe, where despite some bold claims to the contrary, it will always be outmatched by the far greater military power of Russia. In the Far East, faced against China, it will be completely overwhelmed. Thank you for joining me for this programme. Please uh, join me for future programmes on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please also check out Alex's channel. You will find links under this video. Please also uh, remember to support us to the extent that you feel you can uh, um, via um, PayPal. A subscribe star and patreon and we of course accept payments in the new electronic currencies also check us out on our various other platforms bitshoot library rumble and especially odyssey and please also remember to go to our discourse server and check out our shop and look up the wonderful things that you will find there our famous magic mugs our amazing t-shirts, 100% cotton, our wonderful hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And thank you for joining me for this program, and I look forward to you joining me in future programs on this channel, and please remember to check your subscription, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.